So welcome back. Uh, this is just a continuation of what happens when you acclimate to altitude. So the last thing I have on this slide, last bullet point, is you get increased 2,3-diphosphoglycerate. Uh, this is an intermediate of glycolysis and it is produced by your red blood cells. So apparently your red blood cells, your red blood cells rely uh, exclusively on glycolysis uh, for energy. And uh, when they get activated uh, at altitude uh, and they uh, increase their rate of glycolysis, you get uh, an increase in this intermediate of glycolysis called 2,3-diphosphoglycerate or 2,3-DPG. So the beneficial effect that this has at altitude is that it causes your hemoglobin saturation curve to shift to the right. So what that means is that um, when your blood flows past muscle, which is down here, uh, you get an increased release of oxygen from your hemoglobin as it flows past the muscle. So there's a greater uh, desaturation of uh, hemoglobin. So what I've drawn here is your hemoglobin saturation. So the saturation is decreasing, so it's letting go of more oxygen at altitude as the blood, blood flows past the muscle. And this is caused by the increased 2,3-DPG uh, uh, as you acclimate uh, to altitude. So recall that during exercise, there's other factors that cause this uh, hemoglobin saturation curve to switch to the right or to shift to the right. And those other factors are an increase in carbon dioxide that's produced at the muscle, uh, an increase in, the, in acidity. So when you produce hydrogen ions, ions from the muscle, and also an increase in temperature during exercise. Um, so the best example I can think of of uh, athletes that uh, acclimated properly to altitude versus those that did not was this heavyweight title fight from quite a few years ago involving Lennox Lewis and Hasim Rockman. So Lennox Lewis is on the right, Hasim Rockman is on the left. Uh, and it, what happened in this fight was that Lennox Lewis was uh, the heavyweight champion and he was heavily favored. Uh, the fight was at, al at altitude. Uh, Hasim Rockman uh, used the strategy of going to the fight location a couple of weeks before the fight, whereas Lennox Lewis showed up just a few days beforehand. Uh, and then Lennox Lewis basically uh, ran out of gas within four or five rounds and ended up getting knocked out. Uh, so I think what happened to Lennox Lewis is he did not acclimate properly to the altitude and uh, he ended up uh, unexpectedly losing the boxing match. So long-term exposure to altitude, uh, what happens is your body weight decreases, most likely because you're becoming dehydrated and you've lost your appetite. Uh, you might get a loss of muscle mass because of this. Um, carbohydrates are the main fuel source used at altitude. The question here is why? Uh, and I'll show you on the whiteboard. So recall that um, with uh, uh, carbohydrates, um, so I'm going to put CHO here. Uh, when you oxidize carbohydrates, you get five uh, calories of energy for every liter of oxygen you consume. Whereas when you're oxidizing fats, recall that the number is 4.7 calories for every liter of oxygen you consume. So if you're trying to get a bigger bang for your buck for a given VO2, you get more energy out of oxidizing carbohydrates than you do out of fats. So when you're compromised for oxygen consumption at altitude, your body prefers to use carbohydrates as a fuel source just because you get more calories for every liter of oxygen that's consumed. Uh, but this will cause a decrease in your blood glucose and glycogen levels. Um, and then protein use is also uh, increased uh, at altitude and that might contribute to the decrease in muscle size that you see in some studies. Uh, so performance at altitude, this was especially evident at the Mexico Olympics in 1968 um, when, because Mexico City is at a, at a pretty good altitude. Uh, 
Um, and so strength, uh, there's no effect on uh, strength performance or it might decrease with long-term uh, exposure because of that la loss of uh, muscle mass. Muscular endurance definitely decreases. Uh, the biggest effect is on your endurance events. Uh, so because you get, this, you get this dramatic decrease in your VO2 max, your endurance becomes worse. Um, sprinting and long jump, because of the reduced atmospheric pressure, uh, the air is a little bit less dense at altitude, uh, you actually get an improvement in sprinting or long jump or any uh, very short duration activity that involves a, a high power output. Um, and the best example of this, and this is uh, a really grainy images uh, that I got off the internet of Bob Beeman's performance at the Mexico Olympics. So he was a long jumper and he broke the world record at the games and that world record uh, uh, was held for 30 years. So it was quite a, an impressive um, performance, um, probably assisted because of the high altitude. Uh, altitude training. So the question here is, uh, you know, when athletes came back from the Mexico Olympics, um, the athletes that performed best in the Olympic games at the endurance performance were athletes that were from countries that uh, had high altitudes, like uh, for example, Kenya. Uh, and so athletes that were involved in an aerobic endurance events started to use altitude training to try to get uh, um, a, 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 an increased training adaptation. So the benefits of training at altitude is the increased hemoglobin you get and perhaps increase mitochondria and capillarizations. So that's gonna increase the uh, oxygen delivery to your muscles and perhaps increase your ability of, of muscles to use oxygen. Uh, the detriments are that you get a decrease in plasma volume and you can't train at high intensities when you're at altitude. Recall you get that reduction in VO2 max, so you can't train at the same high intensities. And so a strategy that's become popular with endurance athletes is to live high and train low. So you're living at high altitudes or sleeping at high altitudes. And, uh, and that's to get the increased hemoglobin production, but you're training at sea level so that you can maintain a proper training intensity. And again, there's a lot of controversy uh, in the literature on whether this is an effective training technique. Uh, some studies show that it definitely works. And then other studies, studies show that it is not effective, but is used by a lot of endurance athletes as a strategy uh, to improve their endurance performance at sea level. So um, this is an example of how you might achieve this at sea level. So this is the live high, train low strategy. So uh, this is... Uh, uh, a tent that athletes can sleep in and they have uh, 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 air that's being pumped into the tent and the air has a reduced percentage of oxygen. So they're actually breathing a hypoxic gas mixture while they, while they are sleeping and that theoretically would increase their hemoglo hemoglobin production. Uh, without actually going to altitude. So this can be done at sea level. So this would be normal barrack hypoxia, reducing the amount uh, percentage of oxygen in the air that you're breathing. And one athlete that used this, uh, that uh, is relatively famous is uh, Becky Scott from Canada. So she was the first Canadian woman to win a medal at the Olympics. And, um, her story is that uh, uh, initially she won, uh, this is in the early 2000s, initially she won uh, the bronze medal in cross-country skiing at the Olympics. Uh, and then the two Russian athletes that finished ahead of her on the podium ended up being disqualified quite a bit later uh, because of positive drug tests. So uh, Becky Scott ended up being awarded the gold medal but months after the Olympic Games. So she was kind of the victim of poor sportsmanship at one Olympics. And then the next Olympics, she was the benefactor of good sportsmanship when she won the silver medal in a team event 
Uh, so what happened during the race is she broke one of her poles um, and then one of her competitors coaches actually gave her a new pole on the course and then she ended up winning the silver medal because of that. Um, I can't remember what team coach gave her the new pole. I think it might have been the Norwegian coach. Uh, and then they ended up uh, sending the Norwegian coach like a lifetime supply of maple syrup and they held a big parade for him and everything. Uh, so Becky Scott won gold medals at one Olympics and then silver medal at the next Olympics. And the next section I'm going to cover is uh, on uh, diving and I'm going to close this presentation and and do the diving uh, lecture in uh, a new uh, new YouTube video uh, because again I'm running out of time uh, approaching the 15 minute time limit of this video.